Welcome to our third annual Pro-Life is Not Enough conference. My goal in the short time I have with you is basically to kind of give you some background of the conference and then hopefully sort of frame, okay, why are we talking about IVF in this context? And so, first off, like why would we even choose the name Pro-Life is Not Enough? And like why would we have that as the title of our conference in the first place? Well, it was intentionally taken to point out the insufficiency in the mainstream pro-life position. That it was intentionally chosen to show that the secular pro-life position is not a biblical position and it's something that we have to do better than that as Christians. And so Colossians 2, 6 through 8, there Paul tells the church of Colossae, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So, pro-life is basically a secular political philosophy. It's based not on the word of God, but it's based upon human tradition. When you really dive down and look, it has more in common with the elemental spirits of the world than with Christ. And so some of you sitting here, that may be the first time you've actually heard someone not a pro-choicer critique the pro-life movement. And so maybe that statement is very shocking to you. And if that's you, that was me in 2017. For most of my adult life, what I thought it meant to be pro-life was to basically vote for conservative Republican candidates that would appoint originalist justices that would one day overturn Roe. And maybe if I got really serious, we'd go for a pro-life walk or something like that. That, That's what I thought it meant to be biblically pro-life. And so maybe for some of you, you've heard bits and pieces of these things before, but it hasn't really clicked for you. Okay, why would we not only say pro-life is not enough, but we would say that pro-life is not a biblically defensible position? Well, that was me in 2018. I had come to recognize, okay, this view is insufficient, but I thought what I could do is just sort of tweak some things around the edges, right? We're just going to make a change here and there to this already solid position in my mind. That was me in 2018. And so, maybe for some of you, all those pieces have fallen into place, but you're still not quite sure what you're supposed to do about it. You, okay, this thing is not working, it's not right. But now, but, but well, where do we go from here? Well, that was me in 2019. I'd finally come to see just the utter insufficiency of the pro-life position. And it was not something that just needed to be tweaked and fine-tuned, but it was something that basically had to be chucked all together and then something biblical put in its place. And that's a big part of why we started this conference three years ago in the first place. And so you basically could say I've been in a process of repentance in this area for the last six years. And if that's you, I would welcome you to join me in that repentance. Earlier this year, there was what I think at least is the most glaring example of the failure of the mainstream pro-life establishment. And I want to make the distinction I chose those words very carefully, the mainstream pro-life establishment, because when I talk to Christians out there, people who I believe are born again followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that call themselves pro-life, generally what I find is, those people actually want to see abortion abolished. And those people generally start to realize, hey, as a part of that, there has to be some criminalization of every actor involved in abortion. What happened in May in Louisiana was truly astounding and amazing, and I think it really just reveals the reason why we would say pro-life is not enough. I just want to give you 
just a, a little synopsis of that. To If you've never heard these kinds of things, hopefully this will help you to see with clarity what we're talking about. I know for some of you, it's like, man, you've heard this a hundred times, and so I'm just going to beg with you to kind of follow along and, and recount the story in your minds. But I heard Pastor Brian Gunter from Livingston, Louisiana, last month at the pastor's conference down in Houston, recount these things personally. I got to talk to him about these events. And so it's not just something, oh, hey, I saw this online. It's like, no, I've talked to the men, and many of the brothers were, were in Louisiana as these things were happening. But basically, Pastor Brian, he had worked for eight years with Louisiana Right for Life. The last four and a half years, he was in a staff capacity as their outreach director. And so you can say to Pastor Brian, he, he was the quintessential pro-lifers, pro-life guy, right? I mean, I mean, he's working for the organization. He's, he's tasked with lobbying the legislature, legislator there with pro-life legislation. He's, I mean, he's their go-to guy pushing this pro-life legislation to the Louisiana legislature. And so... What happened was, for the last few years there, he was constantly pushing and pressing them at Louisiana Right to Life, trying to put forward a bill of true abolition, a bill that would provide equal justice for all human beings from fertilization. So finally, after a long process, they basically told Brian that if he wanted to put forward that kind of bill, he'd have to do so on his own. And being the go-getter kind of guy that he is, being raised up under um, Rusty Thomas and his ministry, he's the kind of guy that's going to say, okay, I'm going to go do that. And so he got Bradley Pierce, he got into abortion now, and they put together a bill of abolition. It would be the first, the first bill of complete abolition in Louisiana. It was HB 813. And the bill was historical. It was the first bill of abolition to actually make it out of committee onto the floor for a vote. And if you remember, if you follow this in Texas, what happened was we have the pro-life champion, Stephanie Click, that she wins all the pro-life awards, but she literally wouldn't even let the bill in Texas, HB 3326, out to be discussed in committee. So it wasn't even like it was debated in committee and shot down. It was like you couldn't even talk about it. You went down to testify, and she wouldn't even let you mention the name of that bill when testifying for the other bills. And so that, that's par for the course for these pro-life legislators. And so this bill was historical, and it became that first bill to actually make it out of the committee onto the floor of the House. And it didn't just squeak by. It made it out of committee by a 7-2 to two vote. A 7-2 to two vote. And then with Brian's experience... He knew from talking to the legislators that it wasn't just going to make it out of committee. He knew that he had the votes to actually get it passed. So many votes that it might actually be veto-proof if it made it to the governor's desk. And then the pro-life establishment that wouldn't help get the bill off the ground entered the picture. And if you don't know the story... Maybe when you hear that, what you think is, man, after Brian and his friends did all this hard work, then the pro-life establishment, they came in like a knight in shining armor, and they're going to rally the troops to push this bill over the line and be able to get it passed. Well, that is what you'd think that organizations that call themselves pro-life would do, right? But in fact, that's the opposite of what happened. Instead of a knight in shining armor, basically they come as the grim reaper. So what happened was, on May 12, 2022, the day that HB, 18, HB 813 was set to go to a vote, the Louisiana Right to Life joined with 70 other supposedly pro-life organizations, and they published an open letter to all the state legislators in the country and what they said was they won't support any bill that would in any way criminalize a woman. Here's a quote from that letter. It says, As national and state pro-life organizations representing tens of millions of pro-life men, women, and children across the country, let us be clear. And so, before I let them be clear, let me be clear. If you're supporting these organizations, they're speaking for you here. If you're giving money to them, this is what they are saying that you say. They say, let us be clear, we state unequivocally that we do not support any measure seeking to criminalize or punish women, and we stand firmly opposed to include such penalties in legislation. So what they're saying is, it's not that 
they're saying, hey, we don't want to criminalize every woman. They're saying, we don't want to criminalize one single woman. There's not one single woman, no matter how bad the circumstances were, no matter how many of her babies that she killed, they don't want to criminalize even one of those women. And so, just let that sink in for a minute. This is now the official pro-life position in writing. And this is all the leading pro-life organizations signed on to this. They're saying that a woman is never, 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 never guilty in the case of any abortion. And what that's doing is at least two things that are, that are horrific. One is denying equal justice to our pre-born neighbors. And two is denying the hope of the gospel to the mothers that have murdered their children. And so, for those of you that sit, that sit here today that participated in an abortion, that had an abortion, the pro-life answer is there's no gospel hope for you. The biblical answer is that the blood of Christ covers those sins as it covers every sin. So you can come to Him and find forgiveness and cleansing at the cross. And that's why that's so important that we don't deny that truth. And so, as a result of that letter, the legislators started flipping. And at the end of the day, what happened was the supposedly pro-life legislators that had voted to bring that bill out of committee, they made amendments that basically gutted the bill and turned it into just a normal trigger bill. And then seeing that, the sponsor of the bill withdrew it rather than having another piece of unjust pro-life legislation hit the books in Louisiana. So let me make the conclusion very clear if you can't piece these things together that the reason that abortion is legal in the state of Louisiana is not the fault of pro-choice Democrats. The reason that Louisiana still has legal abortion in that state falls at the feet of the pro-life establishment and pro-life Republicans in that state. To me, there can be no more crystal clear example of why we say pro-life is not enough. And that's not an isolated case. This is just, it's like pulling back the curtain and seeing what's going on behind there, really, show, really just demonstrating what many abolitionists have been saying for a decade or more, that, that, that this is really what's happening, that they don't really want to end abortion. And then think about this, and we're not going to address this really at this conference, but think about this. You, you've probably watched and seen the rise of self-managed abortion, all the pill abortion and all those things. What did the pro-life establishment now just say? That none of the women that are now ordering pills online from foreign countries, or I guess even from this country, from other states, not one single one of those women is guilty before the law or guilty before God. And so I think that's going to put these pro-life legislators in a huge quandary when it comes to actually now having to address legislation because they're going to try to deny the facts of the abortion still happening, but they're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to get past it. That the fact that, yes, there may be a few babies saved here and there, but there's going to be the same number of babies killed in Texas this year than there was last year. It may just be people had to go out of state to do it. It may be that it's chemical abortion instead of surgical abortion. But the, the reality is the numbers are not going to change, and the pro-life establishment doesn't even have an answer to how to fix that because now they don't have a doctor to have as the middleman that they're going to blame for all the abortions. And so let me kind of shift and get to, okay, now how do we get to IVF from here? Well, in Texas, since the Roe decision in 1973, I looked and tried to find the number of how many pro-life bills that had passed, but I couldn't find it. I know it's in the hundreds. There's been hundreds of pro-life bills passed in Texas in the last 50 years. So let me ask you a question. How many of those bills do you think address IVF? Not even as the primary issue, but even just on the side. None. Absolutely zero of those bills that have been passed in Texas address the issue of IVF. So that, that's the legislature. Well, how many 
pro-life bills that have been pushed and supported by pro-life organizations are there in the last 50 years in Texas that address IVF? We're back to none. Not, not is Zero out of all those bills. This is an issue that's been totally ignored by the pro-life establishment. Yes, there's some articles here and there that you can go find, but nothing ever makes it out to see the light of day, and nothing ever impacts the legislation. So right now in Texas, the law defines an individual as a human being who is alive, including an unborn child at every stage of gestation, from fertilization until birth. We would agree with that. We would hardly amend that. That's a biblical definition of an individual. But here's, here's the key. The pro-life laws, here, here's how their wording reads. They focus on unborn children of women known to be pregnant. So unborn children of women known to be pregnant. That's, a pretty, that's pretty specific language, right? That wasn't accidental. And that language, I think, was intentionally chosen to totally ignore what's happening in IVF. Because all those children involved in IVF, they don't meet that definition. And so, I don't think it's just that the pro-life legislators and the pro-life organizations have dropped the ball. I think that they've intentionally focused their legislation in a way that totally ignored and did not address the issue of IVF. And the truth is that leadership in the church has missed the mark as well. I'll confess that for me. This hasn't been something that's on my radar. And I know that's true for many of the pastors here. Many of the Christians I've talked to, it's like, man, I've never really thought about that. And the question is, well, why? Like, this has been going on for 40 years, and no one is really addressing it. And Pastor Callie, I think, could tell you story after story of Reformed evangelical theologians and professors that he had lined up for his documentary. And they dropped out one after another after another as it became clear that it is a part of discussing embryo adoption you have to touch on IVF as a part of that and they wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole and so what's happened is this is this has resulted in Christians and pastors n not talking about this being very ignorant about the issue if you think about it most Christians default position is something like this we love life. We love babies. I mean, you can see around here, we really love babies. There's lots of babies here. Not just from our church, but even from the people visiting. Hey, there's lots of babies. And so, IVF helps infertile couples have babies. So thus, IVF is a good thing. I mean, you can see how that logic goes, right? But, but there's no actual biblical assessment of what IVF is. It's, well, the ends justify the means is what's happened. And so, you think about it, there's been something like 8 million babies born using IVF. And every one of those is wonderful, made in the image of God. And so, we're not saying, oh, there's something inferior about these children. We rejoice in those children as image bearers of God. Every single one of them precious. But the truth is, those 8 million children, they were born primarily due to idolatry. The idolatry of having your own biological offspring. And Pastor Callie's going to flesh that out a little bit more later tonight. And so if you think about it, what's happened is we, we have this altar here. Like pretend the pulpit's an altar. And we've, it's the altar of loving our biological offspring and not caring how we get that. So we take those 8 million babies and place them upon the altar. And what you're going to find is, down here at the foot of the altar, there's over 200 million babies that had to be sacrificed as a part of the process to get those 8 million babies that have been born. Two, over 200 million children that have been discarded are given for research as a part of that process. So that's what, that's what lays at the foot of the altar. And then what you'd find is, well, hidden here behind the altar, there's something like six million of our preborn neighbors that are hidden away in frozen prisons with no due process. That's the result of our idolatry 
of the last 40 years in IVF. And so, Christians, and I think especially pastors, need to wake up on this issue. And that's what we're trying to do at this conference is start that process. Provide resources that hopefully can go far and wide among the people of God to actually wake Christians up and have them think about that. And so my hope is that the messages to come will will start to build that biblical foundation that we need. And I want this not to just be information. Like, I don't want us to just sit here and take notes and all this is wonderful, great stuff, which it is. But this should actually lead to transformation. It should lead to transformation in our families, in our churches, and in our nation. If you think about this, the statistics would show that probably most of the churches represented here have someone in them that has children frozen somewhere. This should lead to us rescuing those children in our churches. And this should lead to us helping younger couples that would want to adopt those baby out, that maybe don't financially are able to do it, to come up with the $10,000 to do that. We should be about actually financially helping those people rescue those children. And we should be about forming organizations, networks, where those Christians don't have to go to pagan doctors that participate in this form of child sacrifice to be able to rescue those children. Because that's what will happen right now. If you actually want to go embryo adopt, you're going to have to use the system, you're going to have to use the doctors that do all these things that we've been talking about. That don't do this in any kind of ethical way. And Brother Dusty's going to talk about whether you can really do it ethically at all tomorrow. And so, I want this just to not be information, but let it be transformation. We need to make it clear this is not something that the church can ignore any longer. As I said, you can look around and there's literally hundreds of millions of our preborn neighbors laying at the foot of the altar of self-idolatry, idolatry of our own biological offspring. And so we, as brothers and sisters, pastors, churches, we need to repent and change, turn from these things and let the word of God be the all-sufficient guide and have, have us think through how do we do these things rightly? How do we do these things biblically? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in the name of Christ. Lord, we come confessing Lord, I confess for myself, and I know, Lord, for all of us here, we, we haven't seen this area rightly. Even though those of us that, that maybe have had our thoughts reformed and corrected, Lord, there's still growth.